Hello, everyone, and welcome to Protecting Payments, Understanding the Layers. I'm your host today, Emily Ford. I'm a standards coordinator at Conexus. And before we get into all the really good stuff today, I have a few pieces of housekeeping. So starting off, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Conexus365.org. Uh, please go ahead and feel free to get your questions in early through the GoToWebinar interface. And keep in mind that some of our webinars can be used for PCI continuing education credits. So contact us if you're interested. Uh, this is the slide our lawyers make us put in. Uh, Conexus does not endorse any products or services that may be described or mentioned in this presentation. We can move on. <laughs> I want to give a big thank you to our 2021 Diamond sponsors and everything they're doing to support us this year. We appreciate you. And. Conexus is a nonprofit technology organization. We work on, our members really do the heavy lifting. So what we do is we provide a neutral forum where retailers and vendors can network and come together to work on standards that are beneficial for the industry. We also, we also educate through white papers and through events like this one. And we advocate on a technical level at other organizations as well. You're here, so you know this is Conexus 365. It's our weekly education subscription series, and I just encourage you to please check out some of the other events that we have recently released. And also to please consider uh, to reach out and contact us either on LinkedIn or through any of these platforms. We would love to hear from you. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Carl, uh, PDI, to kick us off. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Carl, Chief Security Officer for PDI, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, in today's session, uh, ACI's Omnicommerce Solutions Evangelist, Dan Coates, will walk us through some topics around fraud prevention and security, uh, both important to protecting and growing payments acceptance. Uh, Dan will be in-depth on each layer, uh, discussing the fraud prevention effects of EMV, the deep security controls of point-to-point -point encryption, and how each of those relate to helping protect businesses. Fraud prevention and security are separate issues, but do have relationships, several of them. Uh, one of those relationships is a layered approach that provides several defenses uh, against the threats that we see out there today. Um, I'll try, try to address most of your questions uh, at the end here. Um, and with that, Dan will jump into his presentation. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Hope everybody's having a wonderful day today. Once again, we're gonna be talking about protecting payments, understanding the layers. Now I'm gonna start from the end and go, and we'll go work backwards a little bit, just so you understand where we're going in the presentation. So when we're talking about the layers, let's understand what those layers are. Um, we're gonna start by, by talking about EMV and how that helps, and then layer on point-to-point -point encryption, how that's different or how that helps with EMV. Then we'll move on to talking about tokenization and how that layer helps and interacts with the other ones. And finally, we will wrap up by talking about enterprise fraud. So all of these are the layers that we're gonna be talking about. And as we go through the presentation, just as a quick, easy uh, indexing note, you'll note those nice little icons there. You'll see those in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. So if you're ever trying to jump back to any of these layers to understand what's going on, you can quickly uh, skim through the video until you see the icon that you need. So without further ado, let's get started and talk a little bit about EMV. It's here, what now? So as we know, the, uh, the forecourt mandate for the liability shift for EMV just went through. We've had EMV here in the U.S. for quite some time now, since 2015, and of course around the world uh, much earlier than that. But I want to take a step back and understand where we came from so we understand where we're going. So just as a little bit of context, when EMV was created, what, they, what was it created for? Um, well, here's some technology from right around the time EMV was born. We have a, a new car here. I believe that's a Honda Accord from about 1994 or 95. So that's when we were developing this technology. And what was it specifically developed for? It was created to address a lot of comms issues in Europe. At that time, if you're trying to authorize a card and you wanted to go online to do that, not only would it be a long distance call, it would also be an international call. So that was very expensive. How could we get around that? Well, uh, they created a standard 
uh, with a chip that had information on it such that things could be authorized locally. In addition to that, it used technologies like public key encryption, random number generation, and application control. So for example, you could have information both about a checking account or a credit account or a savings account on that chip. And each, uh, each account may have a different program, have different limits, have different um, velocities associated with that. So that's the technology uh, heritage. And these cards primarily were introduced in the US because they're very hard to replicate as compared to magnetic stripes. So this isn't even the dark web, this is just eBay. Um, you can get a magnetic stripe encoder on eBay. It's pretty cheap. You can get about uh, 10 cents per blank mag stripe card, and then you can buy an encoder for about $85. I actually did this slide last year and just checked the prices recently, and it still pans out, still holds true. Um, you too can be in the, in, the, uh, in the business of making magnetic stripe cards. All you need is just uh, these two things and perhaps your favorite list of card numbers, and you're all set to go. But with EMV, it makes it a lot more difficult because those chips are very hard to replicate. They have uh, encryption keys on them. They have specific programs on them. And it's not easy to replicate this. The other thing that EMV does is it prevents what's called replay attacks. And the way I like to describe this is suppose that you go into your favorite store and you create, you get a refund. Maybe you bought something, but then you can go back and refund it. Well, if I'm watching the wire, if I'm watching the data communications that come across, I could capture that, that stream of messages, that data, and then I am able to maybe say replay that. Maybe if I'm smart, I know the fields that I can change, maybe just change the transaction number, but I could play that over and over again. I could you know, potentially add to my account significantly. Well, EMV blocks this because, they, because there's, a, there's an element to it such that every single transaction has to be unique. If it doesn't use that random number generator to encrypt the data, um, the acquirer, or the, I, I'm sorry, the um, issuer, the issuer processor on the other end, um, starts detecting that, that you're sending the same data over and over again. That's a replay attack and EMV prevents that as well. So what would we say? What, what would you say you do here in, in the office space there? I'd, I'd like to pepper in a few uh, memes to keep things going. So what we're really doing with EMV is that we're just, we're stopping that counterfeit card present frauds because you can't recreate those cards as easily as you would magnetic stripe. We're going to prevent those replay attacks and then we're going to enable offline use. But this isn't really useful in the U.S. because the U.S. has had what we call a zero dollar floor limit. In other words, we've been expecting cards to go online no matter what for a very long time uh, and uh, communications have been cheap in the U.S. So this is really something was, that was created in the 90s for Europe that is not really that applicable anymore. We're not using as much telephony to um, to communicate and get uh, authorizations, especially with the internet being as ubiquitous as it is and other data networks. What EMV doesn't do, and here I got a little bit of George H.W. Bush uh, as portrayed by Dana Carvey, not gonna do, what are we not gonna do? We're not gonna protect card information on the wire. In fact, there's no encryption here at all. We, I, will, I like to say that EMV doesn't really protect any of the data, it just gives you more of it. We don't secure any of that data. You still have those 15 to 19 digit card numbers. And EMV itself does not apply to e-com or digital or mobility or anything like that. So you're still based on the same 15 to 19 digit card number and all of that cool chip stuff doesn't impact anything when you are online, keying that in into, into Google or into your favorite app or somewhere on your phone. And to the extent that, um, to the extent, <laughs> can't speak, to the extent that uh, EMV um, is simply a chip technology, is simply generating, and it doesn't stop fraudulent use. In other words, I can't necessarily stop somebody um, who has a valid account. So that's the EMV layer. Let's talk next about point-to-point -point encryption. And I, I like to say this phrase called point-to-point -point encryption everywhere now. And I'll get to the everywhere now at the end. But first, as a, as a baseline, we need to understand what point to point encryption is. So first of all, let's start off with that it is hardware encryption. It's going to be starting at the tamper resistant security module on the pin pad on what's called a, a, a PTS device. And so that's going to be a module that sits in there that if you actually tried to get in there and crack the key or anything like that, 
it would render that pin pad invalid. It wouldn't actually run or operate anymore. You, you've broken it, and so therefore it won't operate anymore. It's then decrypted in a safe harbor. Um, so this can be a payments platform or it can be a specific fit for use decryption platform. It typically involves some kind of a key rotation. In some scenarios, it's, uh, it's rotated on a, on a monthly basis or maybe even every six months. In certain situations, which we call duck putt, derived unique key per transaction, it actually changes every single transaction and typically involves uh, industry technologies as shown here, RSA, um, triple DES or AES duck putt. Um, are those technologies that are, that are being used here. So let's compare point-to-point um, -point encryption to other uh, technologies and others in, other encryption schemes that exist out there. So let's compare it to TLS. Oh, everybody knows about TLS, right? This is what makes the internet go. This is what makes the little green light light up on your web browser. And, and all the network guys know about this. Oh, you know, why aren't you just using TLS? You should just encrypt it with TLS. Well, that is used in a lot of cases, but it's just a wrapper that wraps around all of the data. So we have that, it's available, but ultimately you're, it's gonna get unwrapped and it typically gets unwrapped either at a router or at a firewall or even um, at the destination computer. So when you get there, or server. Uh, so when you get there, you still have this data that's being exposed. It's, it's not going all the way through. So that's a little bit of a gap there. Then we have software-based encryption, kind of the same idea, typically using um, some kind of industry standard. Uh, it's also susceptible to attack because ultimately software's got to run somewhere. It's running on a server. It's running on some kind of a device. And if you can access that device, crack that device, then you're able to um, access the data underneath. So that also has its limitations. And finally, um, pin encryption. So I wanted to point this out because many of you are familiar with pin encryption because we use it today. And I wanna say that P2PE is actually very similar to pin encryption and, and you get pin blocks. In this case, with point-to-point -point encryption, you'll end up with pan blocks. That is, there are blocks of data that have that, that pan encrypted inside of it but it's just a little bit different. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, encryption parameters or what they call EPARMs, uh, depending on what the encryption scheme is. Some encryption schemes don't have that. Uh, they, they can do it all completely in line. So just wanted to compare what's out there. When you are looking at a solution uh, for point-to-point -point encryption, you'll want to take a hard look at what's going on. And this, this is especially important in the sea storm petroleum environment. I know a lot of you have a lot of different equipment, unlike say sort of general retail where you can just limit it down, say I've just got just this one pin pad. That's what I have for all of my stores. If I open a new store or even if I buy another store, I'm just gonna replace all the pin pads. You, you are not always afforded that luxury um, in the sea store environment. Um, you have different pumps, different pump manufacturers with different outdoor payment terminals, whether it's Gilbarco, or whether it's uh, Dover Wayne, or whether it's Invenco, all of these things are different. And so sometimes you don't have those choices. So in the sea storm patrol environment, we recommend you find a solution for point to point that handles multiple schemes. Uh, ACI offers that, um, others offer that as well. We have a list of, of what our decryption library has. So when you're looking, you wanna make sure that what, whoever you choose for your payments platform has the encryption libraries, has the decryption libraries, uh, P2PE libraries that you need uh, to operate. So having this, this great variety will enable you to have point to point uh, in all the places, both on the forecourt, as well as in the store, as well as any other uh, points of payment that you may have. So I wanna talk a little bit more about some P2PE options. This is the, really the crux of it, because a lot of people will talk about, oh, should you do validated or not validated? Oh, I don't know if I wanna do non-validated. That, that sounds like less secure than the validated. Well, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. And just so we all understand it, both of those can use the same technology. They may in fact use the same triple as duck putt standard, or they may use the same AES standard or whatever standard that they use. Then they fact, they may provide the same level of security, but the difference is that validated has a lot more process around it. Uh, validated also requires uh, a certain level of, it, of technology and encryption uh, with regards to the, to the cryptography. So they could be exactly the same, it's just that there's a lot more process that surrounds that validated solution. And as a result of that, you actually get a very good benefit. 
you, you reduce your, your PCI audit potentially by about 90%. And this makes your QSA really happy and gives them a lot less work to do. And in, in turn gives you a lot less work to do. Also potentially gives you a lot less uh, risk and you get a potential risk reduction in your insurance premiums for, um, for cybersecurity. So that's some, definitely something uh, to note there. So validated versus not validated. It's not in some cases very different. It's just that there's a lot more process. You may have chain of custody management. You have to do inspections. You have to do um, audits. You have to make sure that your firmware, hardware, software, all of those things are up to date when you are in a validated program. So moving on to the great words of Yoda as, uh, <laughs> as seen in the Wall Street Journal, I would like to say here, I, every time I see this, actually it looks like a head cut from the Wall Street Journal, but uh, uh, P2PE does stop skimming. So skimming, as we all know, is when we're, we have devices that sit at the terminal that are taking data off the wire. Sometimes they, they can be in the form of of overlays, sometimes they have a shim in there, a shimmer, and a lot of times they're sitting on the wire. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The, and it's important to know that P2PE primarily addresses attacks that are on the wire. So if you have an overlay, if you have a shimmer, P2PE is not gonna protect that because it's sitting in front of there. It prevents replay attacks depending on the implementation. This is especially true with duck putt because once again, if we start seeing if the if the uh, uh, decryption platform sees that you're sending the same key over and over and over again, it says, ah, there's something wrong with that terminal. I need to shut it down. So that's important to know as well. It protects all of that PCI sensitive data from being exposed. So we no longer have that concern. We're actually significantly reducing our PCI scope. It's no longer considered PCI data if it's all encrypted. So what does P2PE not do? Well, it's not gonna pre protect prevent that counterfeit fraud. Remember, we talked about that. That's what EMV does in a lot of cases. It will protect you in the sense that if you, if, if they have this data, you're not going to be able to uh, access it, and thus you can't create counterfeit cards, but we're not actually preventing it in any other way. It does not provide us a way to share payment credentials. In other words, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to store this, this P2PE block and use it for later. That's not the way it works and kind of goes against uh, what I mentioned above with regards to the replay attacks. Um, also, it doesn't do other fraud platform features, velocity profiling, we'll talk about the, that in a bit, but P2PE is primarily for encryption. Now, finally, I mentioned earlier, I said P2PE everywhere now, and I want to repeat this because I believe this is my personal mantra uh, for the industry is that we need to have point to point everywhere now. We need to get there however and wherever we can because breaches, have consequences. All of this data, we've seen it, we've seen breaches happen to various brands and it's devastating for everybody. It's devastating uh, for the consumers, it's devastating for the brand, it's devastating for cardholders. An interesting point here uh, in, the, in the data breach, the IBM data breach report, uh, noting that uh, data breaches typically cost a little under $4 million, but they're there for over 200 days uh, before they're detected. Now imagine that sitting on the wire for over 200 days, quietly gathering uh, payment card information. It's a little bit scary. And it's really something we need to protect against. So breaches have consequences, but we have the technology and the flexibility. All of these vendors that you see here have point-to-point -point encryption standards, implement some kind of a point-to-point -point encryption. We should be taking advantage of those however we can. And at this point, I would say, you know, going back to the previous slide, oh, should I be validated or not validated or whatever it is? I say, get, get there however you can as quickly as possible. Who cares if you're validated or not? You're not doing anything today. It's out in the open today. If you can, you absolutely should get to a validated solution. But if you need to go with a non-validated solution, that's a huge step in the right direction. And then after that, you can take a look and see how you can move from maybe a non-validated solution to a validated solution. And finally, fraud never sleeps. And I wanna point this out here. Um, I've, got some, I've got some visuals on this. So if you take a look at this, at this right here, and, and, and this, this has been something that I've been trying to spot and identify, but in, even with all the technology that we have and, and everything, this, this is what we've got going on for, for skimmer devices that sit on the wire. See, we've got this ribbon cable, just this thing right here. That's what, where the skimmer is. In this case, it's actually, you can't almost see it. It's, it's right in the corner of this picture, but 
even if I open up the cabinet, it's unlikely whether I just, you know, the casual observer is going to be able to spot and identify that there is, in fact, a skimming device. This one's an entire card that's sitting within the cabinet. So that's really fascinating. But now think about this. When we have literally hundreds or thousands of stores, and each of those stores has tens of, uh, of dispensers, we can't monitor them all. So if we can at least get in and say, it doesn't matter if these devices sit inside of here, we need to have point-to-point -point encryption. And that means all the data that they're gonna get is junk. They're gonna get nothing out of it. And that protects us overall because we can't be everywhere at once and we can't have experts at every single dispenser all of the time. So this is really important. This is why I say P2PE everywhere now. This also applies just as equally to the in-store environment as well. P2PE everywhere now. So let's move on to tokenization next. I'm gonna talk about tokenization. Tokenization is really an interesting subject. Either you've heard nothing about tokenization and it's kind of a new thing, or you've heard so much about tokenization, you're probably sick of hearing about tokenization. So just as a really quick recap, tokenization is basically taking secure card data, uh, typically just the card number, and then giving back a non-sensitive piece of data, just an un one that's, a, a, excuse me, a, a sequence of digits or, a sequ or some kind of alias that is not algorithmically linked to the original value. So it doesn't matter. I can't decrypt it. I can't use it for anything. I have to use my token vault to, uh, to get the original value. And then that typically is the gatekeeper and manages who gets to uh, see the data and when. But what we see in a lot of environments is that everybody has a token vault. So you're, you know, when we're processing in store, your, your acquirer may have a token vault. When you're going online for your e-commerce provider, they may have a separate token vault. Your, uh, the file platform, that may have a third different token vault. You may be using a token vault from somebody else. So we have token, 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 and we don't know exactly what's going on. Or we have for the same one single card number, we end up having four or five different tokens. This becomes really confusing quite quickly. I would suggest, I would proffer that you look for a platform that, or can find a way to consolidate your tokens. Uh, make sure that if you can put everything behind the same token vault, manage it the same, that we only have to deal with one token and it's consistent across the board. We call this, at ACI, we call this Omni token. We offer it, others in the industry offer it. But having this Omni token, that it doesn't matter where you send it in, card present, card not present, acquirer platform, wherever it is, it's the same over the entire estate is really critical because it then enables you to have some really cool um, blended commerce experiences. So this could include frictionless loyalty, frictionless registration, um, Bopis, Boris, and all of their friends. Um, all of that is included and can be enabled through tokenization. Here's another visualization of it. Once again, you may have your digital going to a digital gateway, some kind of an e-commerce gateway, and your card present going to your uh, in-store provider. And as you can see, you're going to end up, for the same card holder, getting two different um, tokens back, which is kind of useless if you want to be able to track them, market to them, because you don't know uh, one from another and you haven't been able to link them. Ideally, you should have a solution that uses the same token vault across the overall organization. And so that way it doesn't matter what, which way they come in, you're gonna get the same token back either way. So now that we've talked about that, as I said, either you've heard nothing about tokenization or you've, had, you've heard more about tokenization than you care to, uh, to know, I'm gonna introduce you to the other tokens that are lurking around your environment. These include device tokens that are associated with um, Apple Pay and Google Pay. You'll see them over here. Uh, this is typically what we call a DPAN. We have network tokens. These are typically used for recurring payment tra transactions, which uh, subscription services are very big and actually are even starting to make their way into the C store and petroleum space. Uh, we have par values that are issued by issuers, such that, which, which is interesting because they actually tie over here to this um, DPAN. If I've got the same account number, say I've got my credit card, my wife has the same credit card. I've got a phone, she's got a phone. It may be tied to the same account, but the actual device pan is not the same. And so having that par value enables me to say that's the same account. I can perhaps have a transaction from me and my wife 
can return that. And we know it's the same account. We can do that without a receipt. And then finally, acquirers, they too have their own tokens uh, that they're issuing. So now all of a sudden, we have all of these different tokens from all of these different environments coming all these different ways. And so that's why I say now we have too many tokens in the environment, which is why it's so important to have that Omni token in the middle. Ideally, we want this also because we want a smart system that's going to present the right token to the right system. So for example, if maybe we have a recurring payments transaction, we want our payments platform to be smart. And instead of just sending any old decrypted PAN, we may want it to send the appropriate token, whatever that is. In some cases, that might be the network token. I like to kind of put this together as sort of what I call the token treasure map. And this is, again, talking about blended experiences where we can connect. And we don't necessarily have to always meet at the Omni token in the middle, but being able to take some of these elements and create those experiences, starting with the customer ID and ultimately get to the functional pan or more likely going the other way around, having that functional pan or having that deep pan and being able to trace back to that customer ID or being able to go to the par value such that I can uh, execute a refund. Or again, going to the network token such that I can then execute a recurring payments transaction. This is very flexible and functional. We're working on this. I'm sure others in the industry are working on this as well. So uh, sticking with the pirate theme here, we'll go to my friend, Mr. Jack Sparrow who gives us these rules. The only rules that matter are these, what a man can't do, what a man can't do, except we're gonna replace that with tokens. So what tokens can do and cannot do. So tokens can allow you to store that, that uh, payments information. Um, it allows us to give those great experiences, those blended commerce experiences, uh, frictionless loyalty. And I like to describe this as um, you're able to sw dip, tap, swipe your card, whatever you're doing, uh, use it online, and we don't have to enter any loyalty information. You don't have to enter in your loyalty number or your phone number or present a QR code or a barcode. We simply have it associated with your payment, and we can immediately reward you for that. Imagine being able to go to the pump, and when I swipe my card, I didn't have to enter my information, but immediately while I'm authorizing, uh, I get a text saying, hey, welcome, Dan. Glad you're here. Come on in after you get done fueling, and we'll get you two-for-one hot dogs. That would be great. Uh, it allows us to optimize and standardize those payment instruments. And so what do I mean by this? Now, this is exactly what I was talking about on the previous slide. We have so many tokens in the environment, we really would like to standardize on just one. And uh, being able to do that with an Omni token is kind of a, a nice way of, of putting everything together. So what can tokens not do? Uh, detect fraud. It's just a token. And then prevent the counterfeit use. Remember, we're going back to EMV uh, to talk about that. I will say that tokens do, do prevent counterfeit use in the sense that as long as you're not storing tokens within your environment, uh, certainly nobody's going to be able to use those tokens uh, to, uh, to create counterfeit cards. So it does work to that extent, but really we're focusing on here giving uh, uh, tokens and not to actual payments instruments and reducing PCI scope of the environment. Finally, fraud protection. Let's talk about this. So, you know, we've really done a good job. Take a look at these other layers. We've, we've got EMV and he sits over here and he sits over here on the other end. So we know that this is authentic card. He knows that it's not authentic card and we're going back and forth. In the middle, we're using point to point encryption. We've reduced our PCI scope and we're not getting card numbers back. We're actually going to get a token back. So we really have cut down on that scope. So at this point, do we really need uh, anything additional? What are we missing? Well, we're missing a fraud solution. And what is fraud gonna help us with? Let's talk about that. I like this slide here. <laughs> if you've seen this, I'm not a cat. If you've seen this meme, uh, a lawyer few, within the last few months was uh, doing a, um, a Zoom call with the, with the court uh, as, as we do in, in the world of COVID. Uh, but I believe his kids had a filter on Zoom uh, to, that, uh, that made him look like a cat. And he was unable to turn it off. So he kept saying, I'm not a cat, Your Honor. And fraud's kind of that way. You sound like one thing, but look like another. That's a lot of cases what happens with fraud. So I like this. Uh, just remember, I'm not a cat whenever you're thinking about fraud and you'll smile uh, the rest of the day. So what does enterprise fraud do? Well, we're going to block known fraudulent payments. If I've got a, uh, a hot card list, I can block those. I can identify fraudulent trends. A lot of these are associated with certain products that are out there. Maybe cigarettes, it may be gift cards, it may be uh, a high amount being purchased or a combination of those things. We get analytics for targeting that fraud. So maybe we find certain trends or certain things that happen, or maybe it's certain 
uh, terminals, perhaps the ones that are furthest away from the store on the forecourt maybe have a higher amount of fraud. But we're going to use data science to protect payments in this way. We're going to analyze the data that's out there and then create rules to fight that fraud. And that may be Im implementing uh, stricter controls or perhaps disallowing certain types of transactions or certain combinations um, within the environment. And of course, what doesn't it do? Well, all the things that we talked about with the other three layers. This is why having a layered approach is so critical because we have to protect each aspect of it. But now let me talk about how fraud actually works. I kind of did this a little bit backwards explaining what we do and do not do. And now I'll talk about the implementation. So we'll start with our payments platform over here. You have your various payments channels going into whatever that payments engine is. And that should be connected to your fraud platform. In general, you want to just send your high risk transactions in real time over here because this will cause a little bit of latency. So to keep your SLAs up, let's just say we're gonna create some kind of a, a rule in the environment that says, you know, I'm only gonna send my high risk ones in real time and I'm gonna send all the rest of mine in near real time. Well, that's sent over to our fraud platform and the ones in real time are evaluated. This, for example, could be your gift card transactions. And those gift card transactions get evaluated and processed in real time. We can determine whether or not we want to allow those. And the rest of them we're gonna store on the fraud platform because we may start seeing trends. And when we see certain trends happen or we see certain triggering events happen, we can feed back to our payments engine and say, hey, I'd like to add this, this card to the negative file, to the hot card file. Um, this allows us to block trends that are happening as, as soon as we see those trends occurring within the environment. So this overall is how we protect our payments channels. But what's interesting and fascinating is that fraud isn't just about payments. We have to look at fraud much more holistically. So we have other channels that we wanna protect. For example, our loyalty or mobile app channel, and this is based on events. Perhaps we have a single account that's being logged into multiple times. Maybe I've seen this account, but it's being logged into on 12 different devices. That's an indication of that, that card or account being taken over by someone. Maybe I've got a single account, but somebody's loaded 20 different payment cards on it. And yet again, another potential indicator of fraud. If we have these events and they're being logged by the fraud platform, the platform can quickly identify and say, that is fraudulent behavior and we might need to stop that account or shut down those, those um, functions within there. For those of you out there that have private label cards, um, we also can prevent fraud there. So you may see those in real time or near real time or on a regular, on a, on a daily basis. There's two places where we can specifically help. Uh, on the application side, when you, when you have consumers, when you have customers um, applying for your card, you can run a fraud check against them. This in, in many ways might be a nice pre-check to be able to do prior to doing a credit check. Credit checks cost more money. Fraud checks, pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive by comparison. And if you immediately determine that there's fraud going on, whether that's you know, identity theft, true name fraud, whatever that is, you can immediately say, look, I don't need to do that credit check. I can, I can decline this now, or I can put it into a, to a challenge queue to evaluate whether I even want to uh, push it further on into the process. And then from the issuer perspective, if you are an issuer of cards, if you have a private label card or a co-branded card, uh, when we see those transactions, we can uh, feed those into the fraud platform. And once again, we can identify fraudulent trends. Maybe somebody typically purchases $100 a day, and all of a sudden we see $1,000 in one day. That may be a flag, that may be an indication that there's fraud going on. I see them primarily concentrated in the Northeast. All of a sudden I see them on the West Coast without any transactions in between. That too may be an indicator. There's a lot of different uh, flags or indicators that may or may not ind indicate fraud. And that's uh, another feature of that fraud platform. In addition, we can get third-party fraud data. We can get this from companies like Iovation. We can get that from companies like Ethica that provide this information to us that we can feed into our system. We can also provide chargeback files. So we can immediately take cards or, or accounts that may be deadbeat accounts and say, look, we're not going to accept payment until we get restored by them. Or, you know, look, if, if it really was a legitimate um, fraudulent scenario, then we can, then, then that card should be replaced anyway. So uh, we don't have to have those cards incur on our platform anymore. Uh, loading in demographics data, you know where your stores are located, you know uh, different aspects of them. So maybe certain cities, certain regions of the country, and again, certain information about, uh, about your, your dispensers, your terminals, maybe ones that are further away, the highest number ones uh, have uh, a different um, profile to them than the ones that are closest to the store. 
So what can we do with all of this information? We can identify high-risk locations or high-risk mobile app locations. Um, potentially, maybe there's team members that are associated with certain amounts of fraud. And in those cases, we can apply appropriate controls, tighten up controls a little bit more in those, in those regions, in those scenarios, and, and take corrective action. We can also generate anti-money laundering reports. That's the AML. Um, so if maybe we see a lot of refund activity. All of a sudden, we get huge payments, and then we get large refunds. This may be an indication of money laundering going on, and we can aggressively attack and fight those things. So this uh, provides that enterprise fraud layer. And as you can see, there's a lot of it here. This is why we talk about holistic enterprise fraud. So putting this all together, as I said, we're gonna start, we started with the end and then we went back to the beginning. And so to remind you once again, we're gonna go back and go take a look at those layers. We started with EMV, we we're preventing counterfeit and replay attacks. We're gonna stop all of that. Then we're gonna add on that layer of point to point, that layer uh, that prevents us from having all that PCI data being sent up to our payments platform. And on the way back, we're not gonna have any of that data leaking out. We're gonna, once again, tokenize all of that and prevent that, uh, prevent anybody from getting card numbers inside our own environment. And finally, layering on that enterprise fraud layer that stops the bad actors and helps us to identify trends um, that we can apply to our environment to ensure that we are protected. So as you can see, this layered approach top to bottom is where we wanna sit. This is something that ACI supports. This is something that other vendors in this space support. And we encourage you as merchants to take a serious look at all of these different layers to see what can help you in your environment. And with that, uh, I'll be standing by here for Q&A. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take a few questions now. Thank you. Hi, Dan, great presentation. Um, Thanks. We'll run through a couple of questions here. Uh, the first and most obvious one, actually, uh, when I reviewed the presentation, was my first one as well. And of course, it's about fleet cards, uh, given the audience we have here. And so, in some cases, um, uh, in our industry, we, we need some of the card data that would typically be encrypted in order to stop prompting locally at the POS. So, how are those transactions handled differently uh, for prompting to work? Yeah, there's a few different ways you can handle that. One of them is um, we implement and others implement uh, what's called obfuscation schemes. So if we can identify based on the bin, usually even if you're doing point-to-point -point encryption, it'll, it'll expose first six, last four. We're able to identify based on what that bin is. Oh, it's a WEX card. It's a Fleet One card, whatever it is. We're able to expose whatever the, uh, the two or three digits in the track two is or whatever those specific business use digits are. Also coming into this, um, there's a uh, there's the uh, the additional fleet specifications for EMV. Connexus has worked especially hard on this, and Visa is implementing it and is pushing that towards later this year, um, where instead of it being in the track data, we're moving towards a point where it'll be in an EMV tag. So this will become less and less of an issue as the uh, as the fleet tag EMV standards are adopted. So in the short term, we're able to expose just the business critical digits. In the long term, we're looking at moving that data out of the track data, getting it out of PCI scope, and putting it into a different tag. Great. Uh, we can thank Sharon's case uh, for uh, that project on the fleet cards. Uh, she did a great job with it. So another question uh, from the audience here uh, really has to do with um, privacy regulation and how data processor compares to data controller. And so in an omni tokenization uh, type environment, who would be responsible for any requests from a consumer that their token not be used for anything other than payments, such as tracking member marketing? Well, ultimately, any system that is utilizing data and falls under any of those regulatory schemes, whether it's GDPR or whether it's CCPA, um, those systems must be compliant with those regulatory frameworks. And that may include prompting at the merchant level. Um, it, and it, it can be handled depending on the merchant, depending on the system being used. It can be handled in a, in a myriad of different ways. But yes, if the merchant wishes to opt out, they should be able to opt out in terms of do not track me, uh, you know, and, not, and simultaneously not exposing that data as well, right? We want to make sure that's the case. If they do wish to be tracked, they do wish to be rewarded with loyalty, that is their prerogative to do so. But in all cases, we must be compliant with the regulatory frameworks. Got it. That makes sense. All right. So... Um, EMV, you know, we're making a lot of progress uh, in the petroleum market with EMV, and uh, it wasn't exactly the silver bullet that we were all expecting it to be, uh, and we're still experiencing quite a bit of fraud loss. So is P2PE, do you think that is the uh, silver bullet that's coming? 
Well, I think, you know, if you go back to what I was just talking about, um, there is no silver bullet, right? That's why we're talking about a multi-layered approach. There's different aspects. So EMB, that covers the counterfeit and card present fraud. You know, P2PE, that's going to cover you from uh, an encryption perspective. Tokenization is going to ensure that we don't have any data leaking out. And then the fraud protection systems, the fraud monitoring platforms will identify the behaviors that are fraudulent. So no, there is no silver bullet. Having a comprehensive approach is important, and they actually cover for each other in, in many ways. So, for example, if you've got, say, EMV, and all of a sudden somebody's put in some device that's going to cause fallback at the terminal, um, and frequently all of a sudden you're going to see that on your fraud platform where, you know, terminal, you know, pump one or pump two had went from 75% uh, EMV transactions to zero, and that probably means that somebody's put in some device that's causing technical fallback at that device on a regular basis and it needs to be inspected. So all these things work together. Got it, that makes a lot of sense as well. All right, so um, can you give a few examples of how tokenization can be used uh, for benefiting, say, frictionless loyalty? Yeah, so I mentioned that early and earlier and I'll, I'll bring that example up again. So if I'm using my card at the, at the fuel dispenser, I dip, tap, swipe that card, um, I get a token back. Uh, the point of sale system, site system gets that. And if they're able to link that token with my loyalty account, I didn't need to enter in my loyalty. I didn't need to scan a barcode. I didn't need to enter a QR code. I didn't need to key in my phone number. I just instantly get it because it's associated with a token. And it's safe for the merchant because they're not associating with the actual PAN. They're associated with the token. So it's data that they can, that they can utilize within their system. I should be able to immediately get a notification, whether that's email, whether that's text. We understand text is actually a lot more effective. People uh, read their texts immediately most of the time, whereas they'll typically defer their emails. So getting their notification, getting their attention immediately for offers is really important. Another thought, another idea is if you wish to encourage, uh, say, uh, app use, hey, if I'm able to um, dip, tap, swipe my card, and then I might be prompted to say, hey, if you would like to get five or 10 cents off a gallon today, enter your phone number at the uh, at the dispenser. Once that's done, you could receive a text that allows you to download the app and also provides information, is able to convey um, information to link that token. You've already just insert, dip, tap, swipe that card. We have the payment data on file, right? We've got all, we've got most of the information. That's one of the most difficult things uh, when we're encouraging folks to sign up for our apps is we make them register, that we might make them enter a 16 digit account number and an expiration date and a zip code and all this. And we already have the information. We just used it. It was at the pump. Can we use that in an omni-commerce system? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of other possibilities. You know, Boris, Bopis, Ropis, and all the rest of those friends, they all exist, right? And and we want to enable journeys like that. The, the possibilities are truly endless, but we just need to identify them, nail them down as merchants to find out which ones are going to amaze and excite our customers the most. That makes sense. So let's say I'm a... I'm a retail petroleum marketer and I'm not quite complete with my EMV rollout. And if I'm going to be honest, I'll say maybe I haven't started my EMV rollout yet. <laughs> uh, so at this point, uh, would you would you say that it, it would be maybe a better idea to do a joint uh, rollout? If I've got to go touch all the sites anyway, should I be focused on not just EMV, but also trying to implement P2PE fully or maybe even just make sure my uh, terminals get keys loaded? Yeah, I think that's a that's a, a good point to bring up. So when you're looking at it, realize that we are now past the liability shift and you may be experiencing chargebacks. So the number one thing is we need to get compliant with, with Visa and stop the stop the bleeding. However, as long as you've got the, the hood open, right? As long as we've got the bonnet open, what else can we do while we're in there? And that may involve loading the keys. That may involve updating your firmware or update if you have to do a hardware upgrade, updating that such that it is P2PE compliant or P2PE capable. Uh, such that when we come back around again, I can say, wow, all right, now I can go ahead and get point to point in place. As I mentioned earlier, P2PE everywhere now and as, as quickly as now can happen. Now, if you happen to be able to do that at the same time as you're doing EMV, that's awesome. That's great. I just understand um, from the merchant's perspective, look, we're doing a lot of heavy lifting already. It may not necessarily be possible, but while we're doing one thing, we should be cognizant of the other things that we need to do. Great. Uh, those are uh, definitely good points. And so uh, one of our audience questions um, from one of our Connexus staff members had to do with, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, one of our committee leaders is uh, SRED, which is an important technology, obviously, for the point of entry devices um, and one that uh, I'm pretty familiar with. 
And so I know uh, some of the struggles we've had with pumps uh, and outdoor payment terminals uh, so far is, you know, not not all of these systems are remotely connected, right? And so I would ask um, from an SREP perspective, what solutions you've seen, um, either with your platform or others, uh, where remote key uh, rotation or remote key injection is possible? Right. So with respect to SRED, realize that, that SRED is the encryption technology that is behind the tamper resistant security module. And SRED is the standard that that PCI uses or enforces when they're trying to determine whether or not you can have this as a validated um, as a validated system. In general, most terminals, most outdoor payment terminals are SRED compliant. In fact, they have to be if you're already doing pin debit, right? That has to be SRED compliant. It has to be there. So then the question is, you know, do I have to make sure that the uh, P2PE is SRED compliant? And the answer is yes, if you want to have a validated solution, that's absolutely the case. I'm aware of at least one manufacturer that's out in the field that actually has a P2PE solution, but due to some funny business uh, in terms of classification of devices from PCI, they can't actually term it a validated solution. It absolutely, you know, it works. They actually, in fact, have a separate, now that this is the this is the crux of the problem. They actually have a separate uh, encryption module and it, that's not connected to the keypad and it's not connected to the card reader. And that's where they fell into a little bit of a trap because PCI has no designation for that. It's a secure solution, but it's not PCI validated. So, you know, if, if you have that solution available to you, would I use it? Absolutely. Is it gonna get you to validated, uh, PCI validated solution? No, it's not, but it's a heck of a lot better than sending it out in the clear. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Uh, sending it out in the clear, we see a lot of. So uh, I think along the same lines, uh, that will probably lead me to um, a final question here, and something that uh, we've also run into in the past is that in some cases, when you're early into P2PE, like this industry is, uh, you'll have acquirers who release their own validated solutions. Uh, and then as a solution provider, you come along and say, hey, well, I have a really good non-validated solution too. And at the end of the day, it's up to the acquirer whether they uh, will accept that as a non-validated solution uh, or if they won't. And so what kind of commercial um, predicament does that put us in when the acquirer has a competing solution they're making money from versus a solution we'd like to get approved? It may not uh, be the same one. So I'm not sure if I understood the, the full extent of the question, but let me phrase it in this way, which is if you have a validated solution that is validated by the PCI Council and, and everybody operating under PCI is operating under that framework, a validated solution must be accepted by the acquirer. That's the, that's the rule. They say, look, if you have a validated solution that you have a validated program, and realize you have to implement all the aspects of that validated solution. So that includes making sure that all the devices are compliant, making sure that your KIF is compliant, making sure that you're following all the processes and controls. Those are all compliant uh, and aligned. Um, then it must be accepted by the acquirers. If that is not the case, you know, it, it does tend to be a little bit of the wild west. What you do want to do, though, is look for a solution that gives you the best alignment, possibly one that if, if it's not PCI validated, maybe one that is validatable at least. So one that maybe can be validated in the future because they're aligning those devices and processes uh, to go that direction. In the case of the of the one uh, uh, OPT I was mentioning, that's obviously never going to be able to be validatable. But understanding and utilizing industry standard technologies, going as far as you can, I think demonstrating the effort is really important. Look, you know, again, having some encryption in place, especially if you show the mitigating controls, especially if you show that you're using uh, appropriate standards, processes, and procedures for key exchange ceremonies, for managing and rotating keys, you know, aligning with that is, is a really big thing and demonstrating that to your QSA and in turn your QSA demonstrating that to the acquirer is really critical. I can't necessarily say what any given acquirer will do, but what I can say is from a perspective of brand protection, you absolutely want something in place rather than just sending everything in the clear. And the best you can do to align with industry standards is probably the best way to go. Yes, I would agree. Um, and not just in protecting uh, the brand from the security perspective, but uh, the one thing that I think you'll agree with that I usually tell our larger brand customers is protect your flexibility. Because, you know, when you when you have an acquirer and you put all your eggs in that basket, uh, it could well down the road limit you from some other things you want to do that have to do with nothing in paper processing, things to do with marketing, sales, customer retention, 
and other things that you really will have to do in order to compete on a very broad scale going forward. Yeah, and that's something that, that, that we address as well. When we have a solution that is agnostic, a point-to-point -point agnostic solution, it enables you to go to a different acquirer or go multi-acquirer even. We actually have, uh, I know some very large customers that are multi-acquirer and so they're able to go to one and they're able to go to another one simultaneously. That puts them at arm's length. That ensures that they are not you know, held hostage by that solution. Um, also again, if you, if you pair up a, an agnostic token vault, that means that they don't control your tokens either. And so that way you can switch between them and whether that's Chase or FIS or Fiserv or Heartland or whatever, I'm able to separate myself from that such that I am not behoven to whatever they decide. I'm able to, you know, isolate that and, and possibly play them against each other, possibly uh, for competitive advantage, possibly to even take advantage of certain features. So, you know, FIS has their premium payback product. You might not be able to get that if you're using Chase, uh, but if you're using a multi-acquirer solution, you're able to do that. And then you get over to Chase and use ChaseNet. You have all these opportunities, um, you know, so you wanna make sure that you stay agnostic as much as you can, because I think to your point, it opens up the possibilities. It absolutely does. All right. Well, we greatly thank you for uh, for the presentation, Dan. Great information. Uh, great Q and A here afterwards, um, and great to be with you today.